God bless everyone. It is eight o'clock on this wonderful Saturday night here in cold, cold Chicago, Illinois. We are at our third streaming on today. It's time for Saturday night Sunday school and what a blessing this Saturday has been. We have been in a Sunday school boot camp all day long starting this morning with our Saturday morning Sunday school and Minister Jacarius Conley from the Morehouse College in Atlanta, teaching our youth and young adults on this Saturday afternoon. Missionary Simona Petro Ross did an excellent job. Both of them were magnificent. And uh, this afternoon, she was teaching our international standard lesson that deals with Mary's song. And now, Tonight, we are in our Kojic Legacy content, and we are in the book of John and Ephesians. Merry Christmas to absolutely every one of you from Saturday Night Sunday School and the entire team that works and make this go off every Saturday. We wish everyone a Merry Christmas, and thank you for joining us on this Saturday night. Someone asked, were well, you all going to counsel Sunday school on Christmas Eve? Now, come on. No, if any day we should be celebrating, it should be the day that we received the greatest gift, whether it was December 25th, even though we know it wasn't. We are grateful to have this chance on this Saturday night for the 613th edition. We're going to move quick because we have one of the greatest ever who is going to be our instructor and we want him to have as much time as he would like to take. So if you will, please like, share, comment. Do that now. You know how to help us defeat this Facebook algorithm. The more you comment, the more you tag. There you go. Just say Merry Christmas. The more you hit those hearts, it helps us with the engagement. Not so we can be so wonderful. That is not what these 613 Saturdays just to be wonderful? Absolutely not. But so that the word of God can go forth so that we can break the chains that are holding even some of us. We're grateful for what is going on on these Saturdays. And we're asking you to please like, share, comment. When you hear Bishop say something that you like, that you agree, hit them hearts, tag it, repost it, send it to someone else. As we dive into the word on tonight, so let's go. Live in the Light is the printed lesson that is in our Church of God in Christ books. And this is the lesson we're discussing on tonight. Live in the Light from John 1, 1 through 5. The Ephesians chapter 5, 1 through 2, and then verses 16 through 14. Our Bible truth says the central truth of Christmas is that God came down to earth and took upon himself the form of humanity. Our memory verse says, be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. I have a lot of questions for Bishop Felton on tonight. Our lesson name, by the end of the lesson, we will know the images of God, the images of Jesus as light overcoming darkness. Imagine living in constant light where there are no secrets, and commit to discovering how to live a life as the fruit of life. Bishop J. Lewis Felton needs no introduction at all. On tonight, this marks his seventh time teaching Saturday night Sunday school. He is a Bible scholar, of course, the pastor of the Mount Airy Church of God in Christ in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Uh, but God has gifted him with teaching, with an understanding of the scripture that is absolutely profound. And we do welcome, Bishop, all of our students that are currently in the Sunday School Department's teacher certification. They will be on tonight with you. We honor our international president, Mark Ellis, and the program that was created by the ISSD to train Sunday school teachers. We told them that the teacher of teachers will be teaching on tonight. And we are honored to have live from 
the Mount Airy Church of God in Christ on a Saturday night mm -hmm. on Christmas Eve, the one and only. Thank you to Sister Raquel, your granddaughter, Elder Johnson, who are there working as tech with you. I owe them once again as they have sacrificed in the cold to come be with their pastor, their bishop. Bishop Felton, thank you so much for all that you do for us in the ministry of Sunday school. And at this time, we are in your hands, sir. To God be the glory for the great things he has done, for this is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Thank you, Elder Michael Payton, for this opportunity for the seventh time to engage in teaching Saturday night Sunday school. And certainly we thank God for the leader of our international Sunday school ministry, Dr. Mark Ellis, and certainly our presiding bishop, Bishop J. Drew Sheard, Mother Barbara McCoo Lewis, and the host bishop for uh, Illinois, Bishop O.C. Booker, who hosted the Bishop's Conference on this year, to all of the saints of all denominations who have joined us ecumenically this night, we're grateful for this opportunity to share the word of the Lord. Inasmuch as we are engaged in a tremendous battle tonight, atmospherically, as well as spiritually and supernaturally, let us pray together on this evening for all of those who are facing difficulties in this frigid weather system that has gripped our nation. Eternal God, we come to you in the name of Jesus, thankful to you that you have given us this opportunity to come to the Lord's table. Bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed us until we want no more. We thank you for this Advent season, for this Christmas Eve, and we pray your blessings upon your people throughout this nation and world. We have been literally in the eye of the storm. Very few people have escaped this wrath of nature as shock waves have reverberated throughout our transportation system. Many are without power this night in the cold, some trying to travel, some have lost their lives on the Ohio Turnpike. Uh, we pray God for bereaved families during this time especially for Southwest Michigan Agape, who on yesterday, their prelate, Bishop Clyde Jones, was eulogized. We need you. God, we need your strength, your comfort during this hour. May you breathe afresh upon us this night through the power of your Holy Spirit as we study your word. May you anchor us in your purpose and will. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. What a lesson we have before us on this Christmas Eve from St. John chapter one, verses one through five and Ephesians chapter five, verses one and two and verses six through 14. Let us begin with part one of this outline from St. John chapter one, verses one through five in the King James version in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. What a blessing it is to study about Christ, who is the essence of Christmas, from this proactive theological angle. Because for many people, Christmas involves a manger scene, shepherds, and a chorus of angels, a census by Quirinius,
that all the world should be taxed, originating with an order from Caesar Augustus. And to others, Christmas involves the visit of the Magi, the wise men from the East, who brought gifts to a two-year-old child, Jesus the Christ. And inasmuch as these are images that we have become comfortable with, accustomed to, it is as though when we see these images that automatically Christmas crosses our minds. And we've seen the artist's portrayal of shepherds kneeling around a manger in a stable. But it's difficult for an artist to paint a picture of John 1 and 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So you're going to have to allow the Holy Spirit to expand your imagination. Because God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. And that's what we need tonight as we study Christ. Because if you get Christ, you don't have to worry about Christmas. Christmas will come with the package. But the issue that we are facing in this season of Advent, that there are many people who are detouring Christ altogether. They don't want Christ, but they want Christmas. That is a paradox. Why would you want to celebrate Christmas, but you do not want to celebrate Christ? That's why this lesson is necessary, because in the synoptic gospels, there are these images of a baby Jesus and a young child, Jesus Christ. In Matthew 2 and Luke chapter 2, we find these images. And of course, synoptic gospels the Gospels of Mark, who is the first Gospel, and Matthew and Luke. So let's establish that the Gospel of John is not a synoptic Gospel. To be synoptic means that there is a lot of material in common, synonymous information, overlapping stories, parables, events. But in the book of John, you do not find synoptic information. And so that lets us know that you're getting ready to receive a theological approach to Christ that is radically different from the other gospel writers. For John is the only one of the gospel writers who was a part of Christ's inner circle. Jesus had several lists of disciples. They are the 70 that Jesus sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. They are the 12 apostles that are destined to sit upon 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. But then there is another list of disciples, his inner circle of three disciples, Peter, James, and John. And the only one of these inner circle disciples to write a gospel is John. So then that means that as you look at the synoptic gospels, you have to contrast what kind of information you can possibly expect. Because John Mark was not one of the twelve. Luke was not one of the twelve. In fact, the record is that Luke wasn't even Jewish. So not only is it that he was not a member of the twelve, he wasn't a member of the seventy because their job assignment was to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So then you really only have one person that can give you an insider's view. Yes, Levi, Matthew, the tax collector, the publican, 
writes a gospel, but he was not a part of the inner circle. So when John writes this gospel, he has to project a radically different image of Christ. And so you're not going to find anything in John's gospel about a virgin birth, a manger, shepherds, a stable. You're not going to find anything in John's writing about a poverty-stricken Jesus. That's not the image that he wants you to see. So when you read the stories of Christ's nativity in Matthew and Luke, you're reading about the man, Christ Jesus. When you study from John, you're studying about the God, Christ Jesus. And so that is that convergence that we have to experience of the humanity of Christ and the divinity of Christ. Remember, John is the only disciple who dies a natural death, the longest liver of the disciples, intensely persecuted. And yet God caused him to survive because he had a mission for his life. And he writes this gospel in the late first century, in the 90s AD. And when he writes it, that is a pernicious hearsay that is being circulated by a group called the Ebionites who deny the full deity of Christ. They said that Jesus was not fully God, that he was sort of half God or demi-God. And that is why it becomes necessary in our searching the scriptures wherein we think we have eternal life to stand firm upon the doctrines of the kingdom. Jesus Christ is fully God, 100% God, while at the same time being 100% man. There is no compromising on that issue. And so let's understand that the reason why John needs to write this gospel away from a manger, away from a stable, away from shepherds, is because he needs us to expand our understanding of who we have in Christ. And in order to do that, he has to take us all the way back to the point before time begins. That's what John 1 and 1 does chronologically. And the Bible is not written in chronological order, which is why it becomes necessary to have a branch of theology called systematic theology to organize the themes of Scripture. If the Bible were to be chronologically written, the first verse in the Bible would be John 1 and 1. And you can order and purchase chronological Bibles who can give you that kind of timeline. So before Genesis, which means beginning, and before Genesis 1 and 1, which says in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. John 1 and 1 comes before that. The argument that he states obviously is that even though Genesis 1 and 1 says in the beginning, God created, before he created, he had to already be there. So what John does is take you before the act of creation and say, in the beginning was the word. Now, even though this sounds just like little WRD, it is not little WRD. This is capital W-O-R-D. And so that's a whole different image, person, revelation than little w-o-r-d. So in the Greek mind, the spoken or written word is the rima, but the logos is the invisible power behind the visible creation. In the beginning was the logos, this presence, this person who is Jesus Christ, the pre-incarnate Christ. That's who John is writing about. In the beginning was the capital W 
O-R-D, the logos, the word. And of course, 37 years ago at the 78th International Convocation at Mason Temple in Memphis, Tennessee, Bishop C.L. Anderson introduced me to preach on the opening night of that convocation, and that was the sermon that night in the beginning was the word, and I still have the DVD, the original DVD, from the 78th International Convocation 37 years ago. And that's going way back to talk about DVDs. That's almost along with eight tracks. And so, you know, I didn't just show up last night. 37 years ago, that was the message that we opened the convocation with at Mason Temple in Memphis. And you understand that this eternal revelation of Christ as the capital W-O-R-D, who is the one who creates all things. The scripture says the word was with God and the word was God. You understand that with this collateral imaging of Genesis 1, 1 and verse 2, which is where we're introduced to the Holy Spirit and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters and after the spirit of God moved upon a chaotic earth, then God was ready to bring cosmos or order back to a chaotic earth and says, let there be light. John then takes us from the original move of the Holy Spirit in revealing light and then brings it home to us in John chapter one, verse one, live in the light. Notice that John employs these great metaphors. Light is a metaphor of God. The fact of the matter is we really can't wrap our intellectual arms around God. His ways are past our finding out. So then in order to get a handle on God or to try to embrace the vastness of God, metaphors become necessary. John uses the metaphor of light, life, and love in his writings. Why use the metaphor of light? Well, the fact of the matter is without light, life is impossible. And that is why the record is God is light and in him is no darkness at all. We do recognize that God can move in, through, and in spite of the darkness, but God does not reveal himself or use darkness as his mantra. So you don't want to go around saying, well, God is darkness. God is not dark. The record is God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. He can use darkness and work in spite of darkness, manifest himself in darkness, but he is the light, which is why we are commanded walk in the light or live in the light. The path of the just is a shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. Light is what gives us order. The Julian calendar, which is presented about the year 46, BC is what rids us of the imprecise reckoning of the lunar calendar. Lunar calendars are 28 days. It is also the Jewish calendar. But at the end of a quadrennium, you have a few extra days which require an extra month. If you use a solar calendar, then everything is precise. Write down to the seconds. Uh, you probably remember this image of a year of four season of 12 months or 365 and a quarter days, 52 weeks, 525,600 
hours, a billion, 892 million, 160,000 seconds. All of that is what comprises a year. And you know that because of light. It is light that gives you the precision to deal with seasons, growing seasons, harvest season. Everything is contingent upon light. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. But he's not saying that exclusively of himself because when Christ is in you, you are the light of the world. There's that metaphor again. You are a city that is set on a hill that cannot be hid. You are the salt of the earth. This is the image that we need to develop, to balance the perspective as far as this Advent season is concerned. Because if your only image of Christ is that of a baby born in poverty, wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger, then you have missed what the incarnation is about. What this passage of scripture is saying in telling us in him was life and the life was the light of men. And in verse 14 of John chapter one, the word was made flesh, came and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. This is a reversal of roles. For we are told in the beginning of John chapter 1, the word made everything, which gives you an idea of how great the logos, the capital W-O-R-D, because all things were made by him from something as small as a grain of sand by the seashore to something as large as the universe. From something as small as the radioactive isotope of an atom to something as large as a nuclear explosion. The contrast here is that God took the power that makes volcanoes erupt and hurricanes roll and tornadoes twist and makes the earth quake and then packaged it in a single cell that the Holy Spirit placed in the virgin womb of Mary. And when the Holy Spirit conceives this divine child, He's surrounded by corruption, but he himself is incorruptible. He's made flesh so that we can behold his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. For no one has seen God at any time, but because Jesus is in the bosom of the Father, he's the only one that can reveal him, and he reveals him by showing up because Christ is the express image of God, according to Hebrew chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. And when God gets ready to show himself, he expresses himself through Christ. God shifts gears from plurality to singularity with ease. Remember, Genesis 1 tells us, let us make man in our image. And of course, you have to negotiate that because there are incongruent terms involved. When God says, let us, that's plural. When God says, our, that's plural. But then he says, let us make man in our, if you're using us and our, if you wanted to be congruent, you would say images. Us and our involve images. But because God can move from plural to singular with ease. The plural God, the let us God, in our image God, says I only have one express image, and that is Jesus Christ. And so when God gets ready to express himself, he does so through Jesus, who is the image of the Father, who said, when you've seen me, You've seen the Father because I'm in the Father and the Father is in me. Now, if a person tries to be a Jesus only or apostolic, you're going to have some real serious issues with that. Yes, there is a Trinity. Yes, there is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But when God manifests himself, his express image is Jesus Christ. And if you want to talk to the Father, 
you call Jesus. If you want to receive the Holy Spirit, who is another totally different identity and person, you still have to come through Jesus. And so without Jesus, we can do nothing. And that is why Jesus brings illumination. He brings light. He gives us the power to overcome darkness. The scripture says, the light shineth in darkness. And the darkness comprehends it not, can't figure it out, can't stop it from shining. And it is even so with you. that When God sends you forth as the light of his kingdom, the enemy would love to shut you down. But God has already given you power. Greater is he that is in us, that is he that is in the world. He has made the church indestructible. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The application of this truth then is what we find in Paul's writings in Ephesians chapter 5. When he writes to the church at Ephesus and says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children and walk in love, as another metaphor as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. If I had time, I'd read verses 3, 4, and 5. But the printed text, for whatever reason, moves to verse 6. Perhaps we'll have time to come back and integrate uh, those verses. Let no one deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not there partakers with them. For you were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord and walk as children of the light. We are called the children of the day. The scripture says they that are drunken are drunken in the night. But we have been called out of darkness into darkness the marvelous light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. The 11th verse says then, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. One thing about light, you have never seen an argument between light and darkness. All the light has to do is show up. Light is stronger than darkness. The sun rises and never says a word. You've never heard a sunrise say anything. The sun doesn't talk. He doesn't say, I'm here. No, just shine. There are times when you're not going to get a microphone. There are not opportunities that you're going to have to witness, but it would be without the benefit of a platform or pulpit. All you got to do is show up. You are the light of the world. And the enemy knows when you show up. The enemy is aware of the fact that God is in you. When the anointing of God is upon your life, it is no accident that the enemy attacks you, tries to take you out, wants to discourage you or to defeat you, we in the playoffs, you know that whoever has the ball, that's who everybody's going after. Nobody's going to bother you until you get the ball. Once you get the ball, it is as though every member of the opposing team wants to take you out. Don't you know that God in Christ has given you the ball? You've got the opportunity to make some yards, even some yaks, yard after contact, after you've been hit, after you've been slammed. That's what we're doing tonight. Snowstorms across the country, pipes freezing and bursting, travel tied up in knots, whole cities shut down. You can do anything now, it's yards after contact. God has given you the ball. That's the reason why we cannot compromise our message and allow pagan individuals to try to steal the spotlight of Jesus Christ. 
How strange is it that we allow the thief, Satan, to come right up in our homes and steal our message? What is it that you're doing in your home that lifts up or glorifies Jesus Christ? Whose birthday is it anyway? When it's your birthday, do your friends run around trying to find presents for someone else? If it's Jesus' birthday, what are you giving to Jesus? What are you saying about Jesus? What are you doing to lift up Jesus? Isn't it wonderful that God this year of 2022 has brought Christmas back home to the church? Two years ago during the pandemic when we were having Sunday services on the parking lot in all kinds of weather, we had Christmas Day service outside in the cold, had New Year's Eve service outside in the cold. The Lord's allowed us to come back inside, turn the heat on. We still do physical distancing and wearing masks, but Christmas has come home to the church. Isn't it odd that there are some churches that wonder, should we have service on Christmas Sunday? Isn't that a paradoxical situation? It's the Lord's day, the Lord's birth. It's time to celebrate the Lord as king. And then somebody wonders, shouldn't we be opening gifts, sitting around the tree, drinking eggnog? Why? Because it's Christmas. What about Christ? What happened to your witness? What happened to your authority? Jesus first. And if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these things shall be added unto you. You must understand that during the Advent season, there has always been a mixture of triumph and tragedy. When you understand the significance of Christ's incarnation, do you think the devil wanted Jesus to come into the world? Don't you remember those vivid images that when the wise men came seeking for Christ, how they upset everything because they asked the question directly of Herod. We want to know where is he that is born the king of the Jews? Doesn't it strike you as odd that no Jew was asking that question? No person who is a citizen of Israel, not the prophets or priests, but God raised up witnesses. As the Lord speaks in the book of Esther, deliverance will arise from another source. If Israel became too spiritually insensitive to recognize the time of your visitation that your Savior is born, then deliverance will have to rise from another source. It took these men from another culture, non-Jewish, non-European, to come shaking up everything. Where is he born king of the Jews? And Herod is so upset that when the wise men move in a different direction, the record is, that he sent forth his soldiers to kill all the children two years old and under. Don't you understand the spiritual warfare we engaged in during this season? The medical community has said December 25th through January 1st is the deadliest season of the year. More suicides, more domestic abuse, more depression. This is a time of supernatural struggle this isn't a time to hit the cruise button and think you're going to just cruise on into 2023. You've got a rite of passage to go through before you get there. And the closer you get to the finish line, the tougher it becomes to win the race. Yes, these are critical times, grief-stricken times, times of war, times of spiritual attack, times of frontal assault by the enemy. It's always been like that. There is a struggle between the forces of good and evil. But light, life, and love 
through Jesus Christ always win. Listen to the command of the apostle in verse 14. Awake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead and Christ shall give you light. Even in the valley of the shadow of death, Jesus is our light. Even in times of depression, confusion, and war, God gives us life through Jesus Christ. So my beloved, brothers and sisters in Christ. As the apostle says, this is a wake up call. Don't sleep through Advent. Don't sleep through Christmas. Don't allow the enemy to mythologize Christ because the image of Jesus in a manger next to Santa and Frosty and the Grinch, that doesn't work. You're the one that has to put a difference between light and darkness, between good and evil, between holy and unholy. You're the one that has to stand up for the truth with your children and teach them about Jesus Christ. And if you don't have the intestinal fortitude to teach little children the truth about Christ, then don't be disturbed when they're confused later in life. Don't plant the seeds of spiritual compromise and confusion to your children. They need to know up front that Santa Claus ain't bringing you nothing. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Cometh down from the Father of lights with whom there's no variableness, neither shadow of turning. If we want a real Christmas, then you want the love of Jesus Christ. That's what this light is about. It is the light of love, hatred, anti-Semitism, racism, sexism, discrimination is darkness. But let the light of God's love shine in your life. For God so loved the world. What does that mean, the world? He means unregenerate sinners. God hates sin, but he loves sinners. He loves sinners so much in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But then he draws the line as is customary in the writings of John. The contrast, God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. For this is the condemnation that men love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. If you let your light shine, the darkness cannot stop it from shining. Light is stronger than the dark. So the scripture says, let your light so shine. There's a difference between a shining light and a burning light. A shining light points us in the right path, leads us in the right direction. A burning light simply is a light that's on. To shine means to give direction, point out the pathway, lead people out of the quagmire of darkness and confusion. The Bible does not say let your light burn. He says, let your light so shine. Let it shine in a way that the spotlight is not on you, but it's on Christ. That others may see your good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven. Why don't we just pray? Eternal God, our Father, we thank you for this Christmas Eve. With all of its challenges, its storms, we thank you for this Christmas Eve because we can't thank you for the good without also thanking you for the bad because your word says giving thanks for all things 
to the Father through Jesus Christ. So we don't just give thanks in all things, but for all things, because your word says it. And the reason why is because we know that all things work together for good. To them that love God, now the call according to his word. So we release healing tonight. We release deliverance. We release the power of the word of God upon those who are grief-stricken, bereaved, and broken to realize that even in this darkest of season, two days ago, we celebrated the winter solstice at the shortest amount of daylight all year. This is the season when our light shines the brightest. So God rebuke every discouraging spirit. Rebuke every spirit of compromise. Raise us up. As your word says, awaken us out of darkness. Awaken us from death that Christ may give us resurrection, life and light and love. And we celebrate you, Jesus, not just in Advent or on Christmas, but we celebrate you through the power of the Holy Spirit every day of our lives. Because Jesus, you are Lord and you're King. Your governor of every nation and all authority is in your hands. And we praise you for the victory, for the joy of the Lord, and for the manifestation of your glory through Jesus Christ. Amen. And amen. Well, let's praise God. Thank God for the power of his word. Amen. Well, I don't know how much longer you're going to give me, Elder Payton, but I'm trying to stay within your guidance. Bishop, you are just amazing. The anointing that is on your life is completely amazing. Um, I know you have a long day tomorrow. Uh, you have prayer at 7 o'clock in the morning. It is almost 10. So I'm going to keep this part short, although I know you are in your comfort zone and this is not a problem. There is just maybe two questions, if you will. Paul writes Ephesians, part of our lesson, from prison. And as we've been studying this month, the book of Ephesians, we've tried to ask the teachers to give us their point of view on why this is what is on his mind while he is at this point, with this being one of the four Gospels that he wrote. What is your take? On, of course, it's the Lord anointing him. What is your take as a scholar, as a teacher? Why is this so important to Paul at this particular time? Well, thank you, Ella Payton. Uh, the book of Ephesians has as its theme, the church, the body of Christ. And throughout this epistle, he lifts up the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. Now, we need to understand the history behind Paul preaching in Ephesus. Come on, sir. That when Paul preaches in Ephesus, the, ec the uh, emphasis is upon Acts 19, when he goes to a church in Ephesus. And when he gets to this church, he asks one question. Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? And their response to him was, we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And so to understand the essence of why he needs to write this even from prison is because there were 12 people present when he asked that question. And they are in the city of Ephesus. Now, I did see somewhere in the exposition about Ephesus being the second largest city in the Roman realm. It's actually the third with 250,000 people in ancient times. Corinth is the second largest city with 750,000 people. Yes, sir. And we know that Corinth was the one that rivaled Rome because Rome fought Corinth in the third century and came back and did it again in the second century because 
Corinth was growing so fast that it was becoming almost as big as Rome. And Rome was always an insecure city and empire. Mm -hmm. And so when Paul writes this to the church at Ephesus, remember their answer when he said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? We never heard it. Now, that doesn't mean it hadn't been preached. Mm -hmm. Because when he said, unto what were you baptized? They said, unto John's baptism. And there are a lot of people who never turned the corner from John's baptism to Jesus' baptism. That's what I need to open up. Wow. Because these people said, we've been baptized. And there are people that have sung and run down the aisle and shouted, I already been to the water, already been baptized. Well, let's let's understand this. Baptism is never a been there, done that experience. Baptism is a progressive and continual work of the Holy Spirit. And whenever God is ready to take you to another dimension of service, you experience another baptismal event, immersive event, slam dunk event. Look at the life of Christ, several baptisms, not just in the Jordan River, but when the Holy Spirit lit upon him in the bodily form of a dove. And in Matthew 20, when Sister Zebedee's son said in a ventriloquial statement, we want to sit on your right and left side. Jesus started talking about drinking the cup and being baptized. How dare Jesus talk about baptism? No pool, no river, no creek, no water. Jesus said, are you able to be baptized? With the baptism I am baptized with, not that I have been baptized with, nothing about being to the water. He's talking about the baptism of death, which we find in Romans 6, as many of us as have been baptized into Jesus Christ have been baptized into his death. That's why Paul needs to write back and strengthen this church because he had to bring them out of a comfort zone of being in a city where the whole culture was Diana of the Ephesian. Her temple is one of the seven wonders of the ancient world and the church was saying nothing to challenge that infrastructure. When he wakes them up and tells them that you must receive the power of the Holy Spirit, then it's on in Ephesus. And that's when they wanted to take Paul and tear him limb from limb. Demetrius and the union came against him, but God delivered him. That's why he has to write back to this church and talk about the unity of the spirit. I am the prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I beseech you, I'm telling you to endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. He teaches us to count to one, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, one Father. And so the sixth chapter even teaches us how to fight and win supernatural warfare, not just by putting on the whole arm of God, but by becoming the weapons. You don't just have the word, you become the word. You are living epistles. You are God's weapon. And when you show up, you don't even have to wow. say anything. The enemy knows you there. And the struggle is on. Now, you know, we could just preach right there. <laughs> Come on, Bishop. <laughs> you had another question. Yes, sir. All right. <clears throat> and, and you are almost right to that question. Um, as we are in this day and time, and several people have said it in the comments, uh, we are not far from being guilty of what the church at Ephesus was guilty of. Um, how do we as Sunday school teachers, please speak to all of the teachers. How do we make sure? What are some of the things that we must do to make sure we are armed and prepared to teach the people so that People can't leave our church and say, I've never heard of the Holy Ghost or the eunuch bishop who left from service, 
Philip caught him in the wilderness, in the desert, and said he didn't have no understanding. Talk to the Sunday school teachers about our preparation, our prayer life. What do we need to do to make sure we're ready to stand before God's people? I promise, unless you say something else that spurs it, that will be the last question. Well, that is the crux of the matter. And that is the battle that we face because ignorance is a strong, deeply embedded spirit. Ignorance is not benign. It is malignant. Ignorance is not simply, I don't know. So we need to deal with that. Anybody who believes this ignorance is not knowing, that's not what ignorance is. Ignorance is the conscious rejection of the truth. Ignorance is, I hate the truth. I don't want to know the truth. Ignorance means I'd rather believe a lie and be damned. Thank you, Jesus. And so when you're teaching Sunday school, you got to realize what kind of spirit you're coming up against because they are strongholds of ignorance in our culture. There are strongholds of ignorance in our politics, in our nation. There are people that fight the truth, fight knowledge. And as a Sunday school teacher, you have to be prepared to deal with the spirit of ignorance. Ignorance is a contagious disease. And if you don't confront it with the truth, the light of God's knowledge and revelation, then it will spread like wildfire. We see ignorance in operation every day. My people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. And so when we as a culture get to the point that we prefer entertainment to knowledge, when we as a culture get to the point that we prefer ignorance to enlightenment, an ignorant man is one who doesn't want to pull his pants up. An ignorant man is someone who doesn't want a job. And when you have ignorant people in power, which is what we saw for about four years. God help us. When you have ignorant people with authority, with armies, with judgeships, and congressional leaders under their thumb, then a nation can be plunged into darkness. And so, yes, teaching is what we're about. Remember, Jesus wasn't really known as a preacher. No, sir. There was an old man by the name of Nicodemus and he should have known the difference in teaching and preaching. Had a night class with Jesus and said to Jesus, we know that you are a teacher come from God. You know, Jesus wasn't even a hooper, Elder Payton. Yes, sir. Bruce. The Bible says he shall not lift up his voice or cry in the street. If you wanted to hear hooping, you had to go John the Baptist. Now, John the Baptist could hoop. <laughs> Until mountains and hills were made low, to valleys exalted. And he didn't do it against the backdrop of traffic and commercial activity. He had a way of waiting until the wee hours of the morning. Folk called yes, this sleep. And then, oh, generation of vipers, who warn you to flee from the wrath to come? The axe is laid to the root of the tree, and every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit will be cut down and cast in the fire. He got inside their heads. And that's why they left cities and came out in the wilderness to hear the message of John the Baptist. John was the hooper. Jesus is the teacher that can sit down on a mountainside with thousands of people on the slopes with the backdrop of the sea. Didn't even have to hoop because he had already adopted nature for his public address system. And with the backdrop of the lake 
and the slope of the mountainside, the voice of Jesus could be heard by multiple thousands. He didn't even stand. Here I am standing behind a porter. Jesus didn't do that. Matthew 5 said when he was set, which means Thank after Jesus. he sat down, he started teaching his disciples. Even when he was in Peter's boat, he sat down in the boat. And then afterwards said, let's launch out into the deep to catch a drought of fish. Jesus is the teacher. Now you and I, we better do some hooping. My God. You're a black man. You can't lullaby and soliloquy people. You got to cry loud. Spare not. Lift up your voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgression. It's no accident God didn't give a preacher a clarinet, a flute, or oboe. He gave you a trumpet because you heard Paul say in Ephesians 5, 14, Awake thou that sleepest, rise from the dead. you got sleepwalkers. you got dead men walking, dead women walking into your congregation. Sit in their ways, complacent. Wake them up. Thank you, Jesus. That's what God is anointing us as teachers to do. Thank you, Ella Payton, for that question. <laughs> Bishop J. Lewis Felton is simply a gift to the body of Christ, uh, not to the church of God in Christ, but to the body of Christ. It was in 2005. We were in Detroit, Michigan. He was sitting reading the Detroit Free Press, I believe, Sitting reading the, reading the newspaper, and I just watched him and took the courage to walk up and introduce myself to him. And since 2005, he has been a mentor, an example. He has been someone that I can count on for the truth. He will tell me how he feel, and I seek after his perspective. I, I ask him uh, his opinion on particular things. And Bishop, you have been uh like a father and i appreciate you sir uh can't wait to visit again i'm telling you now sister raquel who is behind the camera i'm coming to get that tape so y'all better hide it i don't know where bishop keep that vhs <laughs> but we're gonna have to dub it we're gonna have to put it on dvd because i want that tape bishop felton uh thank you sir i pray for you all the time I watch you all the time on, on sunday mornings and on Wednesday nights, your teaching, your example throughout the pandemic, you being outside, uh, your granddaughter Raquel dressed up in, in her fort furs outside singing during the pandemic. You never stop. You are an example of righteousness, sir. And I thank you for all that you do. Never has said no. Every time we've asked you to teach on these Saturdays, you've done it. And I pray that God will continue to bless you and continue to use you. I'm going off screen. I know everybody wants to stop. Before you leave, Aim, yes, sir, I hear AIM is going to be in Indianapolis, Indiana. We're going to Indianapolis, sir, and we already know, you already know what we need you to do. Yes, sir. July uh, oh. 3rd through the 7th. <laughs> July 3rd through the 7th. Oh, that I, Thursday and Friday, we're going to need you, sir. You got me. We certainly appreciate you. I'm going off screen. Thank you to Elder Johnson and to Sister Raquel Britton, who is my sister. She is the granddaughter of Bishop. And every time he has taught, she has been right there on Christmas Eve. I got you, sis. Thank you, ma'am. Bishop, I'm going off. You have your co final comment, and you dismiss us. Bless you, sir. Amen. Thank you so much, Elder Michael Payton, for this opportunity. Uh, the old saying was, if you know your Bible, the Sunday school needs you. If you don't know your Bible, you need the Sunday school. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for another opportunity to sit at the feet of Jesus Christ. We thank you for your healing word. We thank you for your encouraging, strengthening, and uplifting word. We thank you for releasing your favor upon your children. We know that trouble don't last always. We in the grips right now of an Arctic invasion, a storm, but in just a few days, 
the forecast calls for temperatures in the 40s and 50s. And so God preserve us during this test, this storm. Keep us, even as we move forward into 2023, a blessing upon 2023, a blessing upon AIM in Indianapolis and the host bishops. We thank you for your favor. And we give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you in Jesus' name.